and welcome to the BNL Eclipse Hour. My name is Aaron Harrell, and I'm the media teacher here at the North Lawrence Career Center. And I am Dr. Aaron Miller, and I am the secondary curriculum director for North Lawrence Community Schools. Today, we have a great podcast for you about the upcoming total solar eclipse. We have, of course, Mr. Joachim Ladwig, which is our Earth Space Science teacher. And we are also happy to have Dr. Michelle Smoot who is a 2008 graduate of the Indiana University Optometry School, IUSO. She worked as a research optometrist studying contact lenses in dry eye at the IUSO Borish Center following graduation. Before starting her own practice, Dr. Smoot completed a pediatric and binocular vision residency at IUSO in 2010. Dr. Smoot is a member of the American Optometric Association and in Indiana Optometric Association. When Dr. Smoot and her husband Clint aren't working, they enjoy competitive powerlifting, fishing, and traveling. They also enjoy spending time with their two dogs, Zelda and Zoe. Welcome, Dr. Smoot. Today, I hope that we can chat some about eye care, of course, and uh, vision damage in general, uh, and then finish up with some specific uh, eclipse viewing precautions, I guess. Yeah, or concerns. Um, I'd like you to, to be able to help our NLCS viewing audience kind of find our way past the myth and lore of eclipse vision damage. And I'm sure that there's some stories out there. Yeah, uh, I'm still skeptical about don't swim for 45 minutes after eating lunch. That's a separate thing, but, you know, there's lore. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like for our uh, visitors, you know, the, our, our viewers, to be as, as well prepared as they can be for Eclipse Day. And so we've got different topics with different podcasts. And today, you're sharing how to keep our eyes in our head by the end of the, of the eclipse, which is a cool thing. Do you guys remove eyes, by the way? Is that an optometrist? Do they remove eyes? Um, you can't actually do a full eye transplant because once you sever the optic nerve, there's no way to reconnect it. So the only transplantation that they really do is corneal. Just the and front. And that's the clear surface, mm -hmm. yep, that you would put the contact lens or something on. That's cool. That's so cool. <laughs> All it right. It looks cool, too, postoperatively. Mm. Does it? Like, can you tell that someone's had a corneal transplant? Yes. Yep, they have a bunch of stitches, but it lays over, and so there's, like, a really nice straight symmetrical circle with a bunch of stitches. So it is interesting. With any luck, there'll be a picture appearing right here <laughs> to show them that that's really neat. Really neat. Of course, there must be see-through stitches. Well, they do scar a little, but they're away from the pupil, so the patient never sees them. Hmm. Uh, eyes are so amazing. And uh, I'm glad we have two. Now, we just were talking about today in science class about having two eyes, stereoscopic vision. Yeah. yeah. I digress. Um, a, a lot, our audience uh, is a lot of K-12 students, yeah? but we also have three-generation families. Right? We have viewers of all ages, and uh, everyone, I think, has something to learn from this podcast. I will, I'm sure that I'll take away things, and speaking from my own experience, I'm careful, but I'm not always as careful as I should be when it comes to uh, PPE, right? Um, personal protective equipment. Um, but I try. Uh, I don't try. I make it a point. But sometimes I just can't or whatever. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the value of PPE, per se, and what sort of things you found in or around the eyeballs of uh, worried visitors to your clinic, if you, if, I, if you can share that? Yes. So are you wanting something more eclipse or more just the sun in general? Okay. Mm, or just like from the job site? Yeah. So essentially with sun protection, it's really important because the sun is actually the reason why the lens of the eye yellows. And that's what the actual cataract development is. So wearing sun protection slows down cataract growth, and it also helps prevent macular degeneration and eye melanomas. Mm. And unfortunately, in my career, and fortunately, I've only seen a couple melanomas. So they're pretty rare, but you still would want to make sure that you wear proper sunglasses. And the sunglasses do have to be UVA and UVB protective, because if they're not, then essentially you're not really getting any protection from them. Didn't know that we had sunglasses that had UVA and UVB protection. Mm -hmm. Am I just not reading labels? 
There should be a label on there somewhere. Okay. And UVC rays are from um, the sun as well, but they're blocked through the ozone, so mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about any of those um, damaging the eyes. Right on. Earth science graduate right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, excellent point. Excellent. Um, you mentioned so melanoma, so actual cancer in the eyeball Correct. or the eye cavity or the eyeball itself. Oh, hmm. Yep. That doesn't sound like a good almost thing. Almost always results in inoculation, which essentially is the removal of the eye. There it is. Hmm. Uncomfortable now. I know. That's always seems so weird. But okay. Hmm. So we should avoid that by keeping our eyes protected from the sun. Correct. And with... transition lenses also help. I do should they? say that because a lot of people do wear the transition lenses that get darker when you go outdoors. Mm -hmm and then light when you come inside, and those will also protect against UVA and UVB. So those really are worth the extra. They are. I've always kind of skipped away and just had a separate set. I have a separate set, and to be honest, I think for the person, it just varies on what you're comfortable doing because I've kind of strayed away from transitions myself, but only because I feel like sunglasses can be darker and I can take them off and switch back mm. and not have to wait for the transition time because it's weather dependent. And so in the winter, they'll never transition as fast as you want them to. Um, and then that way I can also make sure that they're polarized. Um, not all transitions are polarized and that's more of an anti-reflective property of sunglasses. Polarization's a big deal yep. in the entire electromagnetic spectrum. More awesome stuff from earth science class. This is great. <laughs> More fun than I'd hoped to be today. Um, cool. Uh, interesting. Um, all right. That's good stuff to know. And I'm just because I'm being an eyeball geek right now. What about just like stuff that gets in people's eyes? Because we should have been wearing our glasses, but we took them off. We didn't put them Correct. on. We forgot. We just didn't because it'll never happen to me. What kind of stuff do you dig out? So that's actually one of my more favorite things about my job um, because we can't do surgery. One of the things that we can do is remove foreign bodies. Mm. And so safety eyewear is obviously really important. And a lot of people just think, well, I'm going to do this for just a second. I don't need my glasses. And then they end up in the office and I have to take wood out or metal. Um, sometimes I see like mulch or... I've had a couple bugs where I guess they were in the car and the window was down kind of situation, but um, foreign bodies is definitely something that I see a lot of. And so so that's in, in the cavity. Yeah, so it can be either in the cornea, which is again, that clear surface that people put contacts on, or it can be somewhere in the um, conjunctiva, which is the white part or trapped under the eyelid. So when it comes to, uh, so that's, um, what was the, we said inside the eye cavity. Yep. What was, is there a word for that? So it is. The stuff you pull out, the bodies. palpebral conge, and then there's bulbar conge. And that just refers to where in the eye it is, whether it's in the eyelid, not on the white part of the eye, or if it's actually on the white part of the eye. Mm. And what about if it's so that's, in the white part of the eye? In the white or part like of the eye. In, like, you know, stuck into like metal shavings stuck in. Do Correct. they stick in? So they do, and they actually rust, which is the biggest problem. So if it's on the white part of the eye, usually we can just remove it. And if it leaves a rust stain, then we just leave it because it's heavily vascularized on the conge. And essentially, if you try to remove the rust, you'll make the patient bleed and they usually don't like that. Wow. So, so that's, that's the white part of the eye we're talking that about, That is right? the white part of the eye. But on the cornea, there are no blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And so when the rust gets embedded, then basically we're just removing it. And then we have a little drill that we use um, to remove the rust ring that's left. So we've brought out a model of the proverbial eyeball. Yeah? You call them eyeballs? Correct. It is an eyeball. So it's not just a goofy thing, I always say. Nope. Don't poke out your eyeball, kid. It really is that. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, anything we should know about that? Um, it actually does not have any eyelids, so I can't point out <laughs> any of that. Um, but part of my favorite is the muscles, mm -hmm. and that kind of plays into uh, the reason why I became an optometrist. So. Oh, you'd mentioned the uh, 
you know, like a, like a Twitch or a spot? Uh, so what it is is um, not everyone has a straight eye alignment, and people's eyes will either drift out or drift in. And so that positioning uh, plays a lot to do with the muscle uh, strength. Mm. And so for me, my eye muscles were too strong temporally and not strong enough nasally. And so my eyes would want to drift out. And so I used to get eye strain and headaches. Um, I'd have to reread and uh, study a lot harder than most because I couldn't retain the information. Um, and essentially it ended up being that it was um, an eye alignment issue that resulted in needing vision therapy. So you basically strengthen your eye muscles and you do eye exercises um, to regain control of your muscles. And then that takes care of the headaches and the eye strain. Wow. So a, kind of a lack of stereoscopic vision. I mean, um, somewhat. It can be kind of connected because, yeah, most people, if they have some kind of a weird eye alignment, um, most of them... Uh, that have the stereoscopic issues, they have one eye that wants to drift in or out. But in my case, it's both eyes. So they're still working tandemly. It's just not the way that they mm. should. Not as well as they could be if it was in a perfect alignment. Correct. Gotcha. All right, cool. I appreciate that. I uh, just wanted, wanted to get some background about eye stuff because I know that there's people out there asking, well, what kind of cool stuff happens in there? And apparently it's a lot of stuff. It's worth 10 years of school. Yeah. That's kind of cool. All right. So focusing more, focusing more, so that binocular vision, we're focusing more on the April 8th total eclipse. Yeah. Uh, as that approaches, uh, people are going to get, they'll get a little bit more nervous. We'll get more nervous as it, as it approaches because right now it's like, nah, whatever. Well, when it's upon us, history says that people get giddy. And unhinge a little bit because it's just not a normal thing happening, and uh, and we and and we'll forget things. We'll forget our keys. We'll lose our. We'll forget our safety glasses. All that stuff, and we won't know what to do. And then when totality really starts, people just lose their minds. I mean, they literally like they don't remember anything. Like don't stare at the sun, and they stare at the sun anyway. Um, meanwhile, certain people. I'm not going to say any certain students or anything like that, but some people will be daring other people to do this or that with the sun during the eclipse? Scale of 1 to 10, good or bad? Probably not good. Um, you shouldn't be staring at the sun anyways, but when you're viewing the eclipse, um, there's a darkening that happens and it causes your pupils to dilate and it allows more light in. And so that's when it becomes more damaging mm. because our eyes typically want to constrict or the pupil, the black part, gets smaller um, when light is emitted and in this particular case it won't be like that and so even just small amounts of time you know staring with that pupil enlarged um, it can be very damaging mm. uh, we're gonna so we'll come back to that again i think that's a, a big uh, point of interest and a, a, not a point of order but a point of interest for sure um all right um Parents are going to want to also know some other things um, like about viewing safety. And we've heard some stories uh, here in the academic world about uh, people didn't know what to do, so they kept the kids inside. They kept them away from the windows, or we weren't sure, so we made everybody look down during the eclipse because we're afraid for the health of our children, which is legit, right? Absolutely a fair thing. Um, uh, and there's a lot of kind of historical hype around that moment, and I would wonder... Um, uh, if you can shed some light on the on like the documented medical worries that await people who like literally, I'm saying like too much, I'm sorry, who literally stare at the sun or we get transfixed, you know, right. and then pff, there it is and you're staring at the sun. Uh, how quickly do things happen uh, and, and what kind of things happen? So it can take just a few seconds actually to have damage because it depends on um, the strength of the light and what type of UV device, you know, you're being exposed to. But for the sun in particular, um, staring even just for a few seconds can be temporarily um, damaging or if too long, uh, permanent. Hmm. So when we get the bright light flash and then we look into a dark spot and you see those sea yeah. stars, is that a... That's actually a very good representation of what happens. And it's such a quick presentation 
that the flash is actually the photoreceptors in your eye, um, the rods and cones that allow us to see light, they fire off and then they need time to recover. And so the white that you see afterwards is the firing. And then as it recovers is when it basically disappears. And if you don't allow your eyes enough time to recover and you're consistently applying mm. that uh, light, then the photoreceptors keep firing and then eventually they end up being damaged. Permanently? Can be. Some people will lose vision um, for three to six months, some people forever. It just depends, like I said, in the time. But the photoreceptors, once they're damaged, they don't regenerate like some of the cells in our body. And so, you know, you're left essentially with a black spot in your vision. Hmm. Like I would be looking at you and there would be a dark spot that I would, yep. would right, see Yeah, right dead center. Yep. And if you don't have a black spot, but you do experience some damage um, that does go longer than that six-month period, it can make things look like they're wavy or straight lines will look crooked, but you'll have like a haze kind of in the center part of your vision. Huh. So it's a thing. It is a thing. Wow. And that can happen in a matter of moments. Yes. And you alluded to... Uh, other bright light sources. I'm, I'm imagining an arc welder, right? That brilliant yep. blue, same or similar. Yeah, so normally when people get a uh, flash burn from welding, um, they realize it pretty quickly. And so they're able to kind of recover or it'll be when they're dropping their helmet back down and they go ahead and they start welding before it completely covers. And so I've seen several of those um, flash burns, I guess you could say, to the cornea, um, but nothing that ever sustained for any period of, or any amount of time. Um, but yeah, tanning beds are another laser pointers, which a lot of kids don't realize, mm -hmm. um, especially, I mean, on Amazon, it's crazy what you can buy. The amount of light and how strong it is, is a really big, important thing because you know, you may be buying a laser pointer that you think is just a toy, but a it's not. Right. And I've seen kids come through where they've injured their eyes because they stared at it for too long, probably on a dare or something mm -hmm. like that. Hmm. Laser pointers. I know that the one that I have for star spotting, there's a warning on the side. Yep. Right? 30 milliamps. I think it's a pretty hefty one, but still. Don't point it at somebody's eyes. Right. Okay. I'm okaying now. I have to be honest with you. This is kind of creeping me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, real life, as my son consistently tells me, real life is important. <laughs> and real life is different than TV life, you know? Uh, I mean, we live in our, our world, doing our thing, but... Eye damage, that's a real life thing. I mean, like it can happen to you now and that's it, it's done. Right. Uh, and, I, and I think as youths, youths, young people, we don't really get that until it happened to someone we know. Right. Yeah, it's always, it's never going to happen to me. And yeah, when it does, you can't do anything about it. Yep. It's an end, yeah, we're in the indestructible years up until our 30s, probably. Yeah. But it turns out we can be destructed. Um, and is so I lose the sight in one eye. So? Um, not in just one eye. It's usually in both because you're viewing with both. Oh, my. So unless you view it with one eye closed, it will definitely be both eyes. Wow. Yeah, and you have to be careful about how you view it because there are safe ways of looking at the eclipse. But if you view it through, say, a camera lens mm -hmm. or a telescope or binoculars, none of those have the proper filters that will protect your eyes from becoming damaged. So mm -hmm. even though you have something in front of your eyes and you think that you're doing it more safely, you're actually not. And those things all have lenses, right? And they're bringing that light even worse to a yes. focus. Yikes. Yes. 
Okay. And then regular sunglasses don't help either because they're only blocking about 90% of the rays. And eclipse glasses usually are about 99.99%. Mm -hmm. And so they're much stronger. And farther up into the spectrum, the high energy part of the light spectrum. Yes. Very similar to like a welder's mask. Yeah. And that's always been our go-to is to use a welder's mask. But it's super awkward because you can't... Right, you can't use a welder's helmet very comfortably to view the eclipse. Right, uh, but you have to be careful about where you buy your eclipse glasses because not every pair that you buy is going to be safe. Mm. There's going to be a lot of people making them and selling them as safe, and they're going to be damaging people's eyes. So there is a website that you can go to, but I was <laughs> going to say I too have eclipse glasses. Right on. So. And, uh, every, and uh, you have some right there in your shop? Yes, I do. And they're certified? They are certified. And the library has some, and they're certified. And we, NLCS, North Lawrence Community Schools, have been gifted one pair for every single faculty member and every single student. Is that correct? Wow. I believe that's correct. Every single. There's, a, there's enough. Um, I was just looking into the booth, and they're all nodding. Yes, it's enough for everybody. Uh, and those are all the top drawer good ones. Yeah? And that's a very good point that you make up. And you mentioned twice on an unnamed internet purchasing source, you can get all kinds of stuff, but you don't know where it's from and you don't know how what the standards are. Yeah? Right. So each of our students will have a pair. That doesn't mean that they won't be lost. Right? Or they won't be scratched because if they're scratched, now they don't work anymore. Correct. Because that gets, it's a coating. Let's see if I can find a pair. And these are them here. They're legit. And uh, and those are the exact same pair that I also will have at my office. How awesome. So though we may not have any more spare pairs, or now it's the weekend and you can't get to the school, yeah, um, they can get them from you. Yes. And the library also has, they have to have a label. that They need to be ISO certified. That's the deal. Yeah. ISO. Yep. Very cool. I'm very excited about that. Exciting. And again, I don't, something about eyeballs, it makes, I've been oogie about them my whole life. Like I don't want to break them. Uh, and it turns out I use them for everything, right? Except pool. Well, no, I guess I use them in pool. Uh, so the eclipse happens. It's 3.30 p.m. Now the uh, totality is long gone. Uh, the traffic is everywhere. We can't leave. We're trapped everywhere that we are. We have to eat our lunch now and relax and be excited and talk about what we just experienced, right? You can't really go anywhere, probably. You take a little bit, and we look at each other, and we go, wow, I my eyes feel a little goofy, which could happen. It could. What do we do? Should we beeline it to smooth optometry to get checked out? Is it Was that the thing to do? I mean, if we so, feel like we're uncomfortable about it? Yeah, it is a good idea to see an optometrist or ophthalmologist, yes, and get checked. Um, sometimes you can have uh, days go by or even weeks, and then all of a sudden you start noticing that your vision is just not quite right. Mm -hmm. So anytime you, know, you feel like you're not seeing as well as you should, it's always good to get checked. Um, and some of the problems that can pop up would be um, like tiredness or tearing, light sensitivity, uh, like a black spot in your vision or distortions in what you're looking at, like what I was discussing earlier where straight lines look wavy or mm -hmm. crooked. Hmm. So meanwhile, rushing down to the optometrist office isn't going to change anything and nothing can be done about whatever it is is whatever it is. Yeah, so... Really, the main thing would be trying to get the diagnosis so that you know where you are and establishing a baseline, mm -hmm. especially with your optometrist, because there's a lot of diseases that can happen later in life, and you'll never know what is new and what's old. Uh -huh. So a lot of times people think, well, if can, nothing can be done and it's permanent, what's the point? But it actually is really important for future mm -hmm. eye exams. And I wonder, um, we've, we've burnt the inside of our eyeball, so a cold compress on our eye will have no effect because it's already Correct. on the inside of you, right? Hmm. So what's done is done. 
And I don't, I don't mean to go on and be all, oh my gosh, but at the same time, oh my gosh, right? This is a thing and we need to be cautious and aware of that. And as a service to our viewers and sponsors, we like to follow up with a specific uh, eclipse safety tips uh, at the end or during our broadcasts. Now, we people, dogs, cats, mammals, know not to look at the sun. It hurts, yeah? Uh, but here at the eclipse, we're drawn to look at the sun, yeah? Uh, so we know not to look at the sun with our unprotected eyes. And, and we know that we look into the sun and it hurts, right? And, and, and you, we tear up. It's a natural. Right. Okay. So our brain knows to look away and we should definitely look away. Um, so let me ask three true or four false questions, I guess. True or false? During the hours-long eclipse process, a quick glance at the sun, uh, like we do on any, any other give, like we glance at the sun, is probably no big deal. False. False. Yeah, it can only take a couple of seconds, and so I would not recommend risking it to even just look for a second, mm -hmm. because more often than not, you're going to get kind of trapped into wanting to look at it longer, and so I would definitely say false. False. And, it, and this effect is a mesmerizing thing. Yeah. And I don't know that it should be heavily advertised, but in 100% totality, you do have the ability of viewing it without eye damage. It and is. The fact that no one is really going to know when that is, is reason enough not to attempt to look at it. Mm. And, and that is the part that we have to get around to. Yeah. Uh, Question number two, is it safe to look at the fully occluded, fully blacked out sun, uh, the big hole in the sky, uh, without eye protection? And that would be true. And that answer is it absolutely is safe because there's no radiation coming. And in fact, our eclipse, um, if memory serves, the sun is 100% of the size of the sun, but the moon in its location will actually be 102% the size of the sun. So it'll actually be a little bit bigger. We'll get a complete blackout yep. right here in Bedford which is going to be awesome. Um, uh, but right up until that moment, it's the sun. Correct. And so right up until that moment, glass is on. And we're looking up at the sun, and you can see that we can see that sliver of the sun getting smaller and smaller, then all of a sudden, it'll be gone. And at that moment, we can take off our solar eclipse glasses, and you can look at the sun. And here in Bedford, we have three minutes and 40 seconds or so of I don't want to say pitch dark, but it's going to be pretty dark. And, uh, and the invitation is absolutely to look. Right. Uh, and during that time, the corona, the, the corona will come out around the sides. Uh, we may be able to see stars out behind the sun that we never get to see because they're on the other side of the sun. Um, but then uh, toward the end, it will just come out. Uh, and there may be, be a little, little twinkling moment as the as the mountains of the moon pass to the edge of the sun. And that twinkling moment, if you get that, look away, put on your glasses. Yeah? Correct. Yep. Uh, and after that, it's full sun again. Yeah. Cool. So surprisingly enough, uh, we've gotten to the bottom of the list of things that I can think of to ask. Uh, oh, we've got a question from the crew. Um, we have a question from a community member. Are our old solar eclipse glasses from 2017 still safe to use? So we had a partial eclipse mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, I do know some community members have held on to those glasses in anticipation of this event. And we would just like to know, are those still safe to use? And they actually are um, as long as you've taken care of them. Uh, I know I kept mine and they're in the sleeve that they originally came mm -hmm. in, and so they are still safe to wear. But you do want to make sure that there aren't scratches and that they're not wrinkled and damaged. But, yeah, you can totally take those out and use them. Thank you. Totality, take them out. <laughs> yeah, right on. Uh, but it's certainly if you have brand new ones, yeah, those that's should the be, way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Excellent question. Uh, thank you for asking. All right. Um, so we've gotten to the bottom of the list. Uh, is there anything that we've missed that I that we didn't ask that you think we should know about? 
that comes to mind? We've kind of rambled around eye yeah. safety and eye care, but. I'm just curious. I know that the schools are going to be out as mm -hmm. far as I understand. Are any of the schools making any projectors or any devices that can be used instead of the glasses? As we go to visit the schools, uh, we'll be talking about some of that. Yeah. Um, but at this moment, as far as I know, since everybody has glasses, we don't have to have the tools. Um, but I think personally, just between you and me, just between us, building the tool is kind of cool because yeah. then you can look at the sun and you can see the geometric effects that happen, right? Um, as uh, Dr. Pilikowski mentioned, you can use a colander like a regular noodle strainer and just hold it up and look at what happens underneath. And if you don't try that, you'll never know. Yeah, uh, cut a hole in a piece of paper and just see what it does on the sidewalk or on the side of the wall. Uh, but we'll talk about viewers, and there's lots and lots of viewing options that are out there. And I would encourage it just because the experience is cool. The experiment of playing with light is neat, yeah? Yeah, and that's how I remember growing up and viewing the eclipse. So it is kind of a neat thing to do. Yeah, and I'm hoping that we get a chance to go and visit some of the schools and play around with that stuff with the kids because those are the memories. Those are the memories. Uh, like we say in the classroom, right? we can talk about it or we can do it. And when we do it, even the, the slightest way, that sticks in our heads. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, doctor, for sharing these deep insights deep into our eyes and to the physics and to the, uh, uh, the maladies that are brought on by the sun uh, just by a lack of attention, right, to something that we see every day. Um, and here at this exposure with our eyes really dilated, right, um, that's the moment when we are the most susceptible to whatever the billions of candle power of the sun, right? right. Uh, burning right into the back of our eyes and leaving a permanent scar, which would be a terrible thing. And it'd be a horrible memory to carry with you for your grandkids when you're, when you have grandkids like, Oh, I can't see still because of that eclipse thing. So take care of yourself. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smoot. Uh, this has been awesome. And uh, I really, really appreciate you coming to visit us today. Thanks for having me. Hmm. Indeed. So until next time, stay inspired and keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>